So, we are going to start uh, the afternoon uh, with uh, two presentations I was uh, asked to give about uh, the design requirements for nuclear power plants on the IE. So, over the time, I have to change a bit the uh, focus on the presentation because I also, no, no, that's not it. Sorry, yeah. excuse me. Hopefully it's that one, yeah. Okay, so I changed a bit because uh, there has been some reorganization of the draft agenda and uh, a number of uh, topics on related to the requirements has been previously presented uh, during the week. And uh, then I have seen, I mean, there's going to be a bit of, a, of an overlapping, but I try not to do too much of an overlap. So the first presentation is going to be about the requirements themselves. Uh, the requirements are something that are very dry, uh, or one by one, what this is the requirement. And it's not uh, very, uh, I would say, uh, beneficial or, 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 or nice or attractive that I just read what you can read in a, in, in a document uh, without providing further elaboration that also will take a lot of time. So I'm going to say something about the overall perspective of the requirements. Uh, uh, why do we have the requirements? Uh, why they are important? For what are the requirements and so on? And I will uh, go into some specific topics and then uh, some details of some of the general uh, requirements, principal requirements, so on. Then we have requirements for uh, every system, every system important to safety at the plan, specific requirements for every system. I will not go into those details because it will really take very long and uh, it's not really going to, to, to help that much, That's just, just requirement by requirement. So I focus on the general picture and some, some of the concepts and then we are going to be elaborating more in a second presentation that is based, uh, it is based not on the standards of the IEA, but based in some further detailed work that we have in a tech talk that we are developing. So I'm going to be tech talking then later about these topics of design extension condition and so on that you have heard as well and uh, has been now put in my presentation. So for the moment, uh, I will try to give you a perspective of the document and some insights and the most important uh, requirements. So, uh, sorry, wrong direction. This picture you have seen it. You have seen it because Marco has uh, presented to you. I gave him the picture. But Marco Gasparini was uh, the person who developed the, the requirements in SSR two slash one, and he retired in 2011. And um, in this regards, his successor. He. The requirements for design uh, were approved shortly after the Fukushima accident, but where we had them fin practically finalized, uh, they were approved uh, in September 2011, a couple of weeks after Marco left. So this is his work. Uh, requirements for design uh, relate to the fundamental safety principles. We have 10 principles and one safety objective. This has been explained to you. And uh, there is one number eight related to the prevention of accidents. And for the prevention of accidents, the requirements for design are very important. I will not do this. This is the evolution. The previous requirements, you know, were from 2010 and the new ones are 2012. And now we have been revised, revising them after the Fukushima accident to take into account wherever necessary, some lessons learned. We took some lessons learned. I think that the Japanese are those that should be taking really the lessons. But uh, to be proactive, we have reinforced some things. But uh, in fact, if you compare the design of Japan with uh, the standards of 2000, year 2000, there were some things that were not uh, taken into account by them. So this revision has finalized this year. They are approved, and uh, we are in the final editorial process, and there is a commitment of the IEA to have them printed with a stamp of, uh, with a date of uh, 2015. So hopefully, 
we succeed. We have two months to do that. So, but we are at the end. Um, good. Under these requirements, it was probably explained to you, we have a collection of safety guides that we are now revising to make them consistent with the, with the new requirements, because currently they are requirement consistent with the previous requirements document. It's not that uh, there is a revolution in the requirement. It's not that uh, everything has been changed. It is more that uh, we have reinforced the requirements and we have reorganized them and put in a more logical manner. Uh, now, as you have probably have heard, these requirements are primarily based for uh, light water reactors for water-cooled reactors. We think always like water reactors, but there are also heavy water reactors there. Uh, Land-based water reactors. But maybe use using some adjustment uh, to other reactor types uh, to determine the, uh, uh, what is you know, uh, the essence of the requirements, what, how they can be applied. Actually, this is a work that is being done uh, for uh, developing new requirements for generation four reactors, for these fast reactors, uh, sodium fast reactors, and so on. Starting from the requirements of the IE, trying to see what is the rationale for those requirements and trying to elaborate requirements for the for generation four reactors. Uh, the new requirements may be not applicable to exist, I mean, not be easy, not practical to apply to uh, existing nuclear power plants because there are some things that are difficult to change. Sometimes you can upgrade your design, but sometimes you have limitations. So if you want now to design an existing nuclear power plants to be able to uh, withstand uh, severe accidents, uh, you may not be able to to put something like a core catcher or something like this. Yeah? So it is uh, sometimes not practicable to uh, apply in full all the new requirements. But uh, for others, uh, there are uh, backfitting programs, there are uh, refurbishment programs that can be implemented, for instance, in the context of the periodic safety review. Now, probably has been also explained, I don't know, what, why are important the, the requirements for design. The requirements for design are of, of particular importance because they establish what is the, the, the safety levels for the uh, design of nuclear power plants. They reflect, they try to reflect the state of the art, they reflect the safety measures that are being implemented in the newest generations of uh, reactors that are being uh, uh, licensed. They reflect also what are the views and the practice of the uh, in licensing of the, of the member states for these reactors. And these are, as many other uh, IE safety standards, these are documents of large consensus. It's very difficult to reach this consensus sometimes, but it is a, a document of consensus. And this one in particular is important also because it establishes the links between the requirements for, for site evaluation and the requirements for software operation of the plant after it has been designed. So it takes into account the impact of the uh, site on the design, and then so the, the requirements for design are also there to facilitate the, the operation of the plant. They are also the main reference uh, to perform uh, design reviews, not only by IEA, but also can be the basis uh, for um, the member states to develop their own uh, regulations and their own uh, review uh, processes. And uh, also the requirements contribute, after all the discussions, to establish a common safety approach and a terminology. Our standards are sometimes uh, adopted or by in national regulations. Mostly there are some notice in adoption, there is some uh, consideration on the requirements of analysis of them, and they are used uh, to uh, develop their own national regulations. And in fact, recently, for instance, we have been requested to revise, to, to review, excuse me, and compare regulations in some countries for design with our standards. Okay. This you have seen, this is the structure of the requirements, how they are done, and we have a part with introduction and principles and concepts. Then we have requirements for the management system of, of the design. 
Uh, then we have requirements applicable to all CCs that are important to safety, divided into, into sections. Those are mainly those that I'm going to, to explain now. And then we have requirements for the specific systems. So, and there, of course, we have requirements for every important uh, plan system from the reactor core, the, the, the uh, reactor shutdown system, the cooling system, the electrical system, the instrumentation, auxiliary systems, uh, and so on. All of them. So uh, this is how we have this distribute. I think Marco has shown them to you. And uh, as I say, I'm going to be concentrated on this set general plan design and, and principal technical requirements. And uh, requirements uh, of the IEA use the shell language. Uh, and now in this new system that we have in this new generation of uh, requirements, we have uh, reduced the number of requirement statements and we have some overarching requirements and some, some other requirements that elaborate on the overarching requirements. So basically here, what I'm going to explain is always the overarching requirement, the details. Uh, normally I will, I will not because it will uh, take too much time. Only in some cases, I will provide some a bit of an explanation. I'm going to repeat maybe some of the concepts, but uh, this is important because in the next presentation and so on, I'm going to be focusing on these uh, topics of defense in depth and, uh, and the different plant states and the design extension condition and so on. And this, uh, the, 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 the subject of defense in depth, I know you heard this uh, before in this week, it's come, uh, of course, this is a concept that it is very old, as I said before, has been. Uh, uh, used in the military and in other uh, technical areas. But in our case, uh, it's something that started developing more thoroughly about uh, after the Chernobyl accident. And it is indicated in the fundamental safety principle uh, number eight, which goes about the prevention of accidents. It says that uh, all practical efforts must be made to prevent and mitigate uh, nuclear or radiation uh, accidents. And after that, it says that the primary means for preventing and mitigating the consequences of accidents is, is defense in depth. And defense in depth, normally people associated them to barriers, which is true, but uh, the defense in depth as such are not just the barriers. You can have defense in depth also in other contexts without barriers. So defense in depth, the way it should be understood is implemented through the combination of a number of consecutive uh, uh, and independent levels of protection or layers of protection. We will see that not everything is barrier. What happened is that uh, at the end, to protect the people and the environment from uh, the effects of uh, radiation protection, you need barriers. You need this. Sometimes you need uh, confinement, other times you just need a shielding. You don't, because nothing escapes from the source. Just a shielding, what, what you need. And the alternative to, to barriers is, uh, is distance. But distance is not practical, because you're not going to be kilometers away from the source, and sometimes you need to be close. So at the end, if you take out the distance, you need barriers. And the barriers, of course, depends on the source. And this can be a nice barrier for uh, alpha particles. I hope the water is not contaminated, because I'm going to drink. But in reality, uh, when we deal with a reactor core, with the fuel, we need several barriers, because uh, these barriers may be challenged. These barriers, normally what happens is that uh, the enclosed um, internal energy, because we have a lot of heat in the fuel, because also we have heat and pressure in the primary system. So this, and because also we have, the barriers can be challenged from outside. So we can also have a, an aircraft crash. So barriers also prevent the release of radioactivity because of an external agent on the installation. So we have the barriers because they are necessary. 
and we need to protect the barriers. And for protecting the barriers, uh, we need to take care of the external hazard, the aircraft crash, for instance. But we also need to take care of uh, ensuring that the barriers will not fail because of the internal energy that is inside. Those, all of these things are uh, very well known to you. But this is what it brings uh, inside the defense in depth, the two things that we need barriers and we need to protect them. And for protecting the barriers at the nuclear power plant, we need to fulfill the so-called fundamental safety function that you have heard. So if you control the react reactivity, you're controlling the generation of energy. If you control the core, the cooling of the fuel, you are controlling the removal of energy. And then if you maintain the integrity of the barrier in the place where it is, you confine what is inside. So these are the three things and the so-called fundamental safety pillar or something like this. Matthew Marco, I saw on the slides, he explained it to you. So I'm going to go a bit on the requirements having made this, uh, this uh, comment. And we'll be there seeing some uh, of the elements of defense in there. Uh, the management of systems, we have three requirements, and this, but uh, I'm not going to provide any, any details. So the question is who has the responsibility for the management of the uh, design? The, respons the responsible, primary responsible for safety, you always know, is the, is the licensee. So at the end, the, the, the responsibility is transferred to the licensee. So the licensee is responsible that what he or what submits or she submits know, to the regulatory body has to ensure that applic uh, uh, meets all applicable uh, uh, requirements for safety. And for doing that, he has to ensure also that uh, all the safety requirements that were established for the design are considered and implemented through all the phases of the design and also so, and so and that it, the final design meets the, the requirements. And he has to be make sure that the requirements are maintained. Requirements for design are maintained through all this, uh, the the lifetime of the plan. And for doing this, the designer and then the operator need to develop a management system. We have some detail. These requirements that develop this in more detail, but I don't think this is uh, what uh, we want now to to go into the detail. I'm going to talk about its principal uh, uh, requirements. These are uh, nine requirements we have now here. And uh, the first one is about the fundamental safety uh, functions. And it says we have to fulfill them or ensure that the fundamental safety functions are fulfilled in all plant states. So they must be always fulfilled. Um, of course, I mean, uh, you could say, well, if you have a, a reactor meltdown, at some point I have failed the removing of the of the heat, and you are right. But even though at this moment you have failed this function, and you have to make sure that you um, confine the radioactive material, you need in the long term to reestablish and to make sure that you're going to be continue cooling the, 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 the fuel and for sure make sure that the reactivity is under control because otherwise you will not be able to, to confine. So, but without having failures, without going to this place, uh, to this point, this, these functions must be always fulfilled during normal operation, abnormal operation, accident conditions, and so on. So this is why by fulfilling these functions, is the way you ensure that the barriers will not uh, fail. So what you have to do is to have to identify what are the systems that you have in your design to uh, fulfill those functions. Of course, they are designed with some criteria. It comes later. And you need to have always the operator needs to have the design has to provide for ways to monitor that you are fulfilling this function. So you have to be able to know that you are cooling the core, that uh, there are uh, reactivity in the core is control and the status of the containment and so on, the barriers and so on. Uh, we have requirements for radiation protection in the design because, of course, it's not only about accidents, but also during normal operation. Uh, the doses should be minimized uh, inside the plant also for, uh, for the workers and for members of the public. 
So uh, the way to do this is to establish measures uh, already in the in the in the design. But the topic I want here maybe to emphasize to talk because it is of interest is that we have included in the requirements to establish establish measures in the design in a manner that uh, accidents that can lead to uh, high radiation doses or large radiation releases are practically eliminated. Uh, so, and this is of course difficult to, to achieve and this is the, the, the topic of uh, the design of uh, uh, safety systems and, and these safety features for that. We are going to be discussing this point later, but it is the, the first place where we find something like this now in the requirements for design. Um, in design for a nuclear power plants, uh, we have a requirement saying that the design of a nuclear power plant shall ensure that the plant and items important to safety have appropriate characteristics to ensure that safety functions can be performed with the necessary reliability, and so on. And so that means this requirement is going to tell us that you cannot install any component there. So for meeting this reliability, you have to be complying with uh, a number of uh, design codes. Uh, you have also uh, to take care uh, that uh, the plan uh, does not uh, exceed, uh, has to take into account the capabilities of, of the operators and so on. So it's a, it's a whole, uh, it's a whole thing. Um, then we have a requirement for in defense in depth. So now when it comes to the implementation of defense in depth, and this tells us that we have to implement le the several levels of defense in depth, and the levels uh, shall be independent as far as practicable. This is natural and logical because if you have several levels of defense, and they are not independent, then they don't contribute too much. Because if you fail one level and fail because of something that affects the second level, so the second level may fail and so on. So there can be a cascade effect. The problem is that uh, it is not always to make sure that those levels are independent. There are always limitations an important limitation. So this is uh, another topic which is explained in the, in the next presentation. But to tell you something, for instance, just to give you an example, you have an earthquake, and the earthquake affects all the levels of defense in that. And the operator is there, and it's the same for when operating all the systems and so on. And if you want to go into more uh, system design considerations, well, you cannot afford to have a containment for design basis accidents and another containment for civil accidents. So sometimes you are forced to share some systems. But there are other cases in which you don't need re really, you don't need to share, but some design share because, of course, it's more economic, uh, more practical, and so on. But now the requirements we say that they shall be independent as far as practicable. Now the question is, what does it mean? How independent is independent enough? So we have this requirement and, and say that relaxation shall be justified. Okay. And then, of course, when you have the levels of defense in depth, you cannot just rely on the last one. You cannot weaken the level of defense in depth uh, thinking, OK, I have others. Because otherwise, this spoils the concept of defense in depth. Now, it says something also about uh, some uh, uh, aspects of the defense in depth provision. It said that the, the design shall provide multiple physical barriers. This we know what are the physical barriers from the fuel, uh, the reactor coolant boundary, the containment, and so on. It says about the, the quality of the equipment participating in the defense in the measures, the high quality uh, for preventing the, the failures, for preventing accidents. It says about the conservativity of the 
of the analysis and the, the design and the construction and so on. And then uh, it says also about the preference in the use of measures. So if possible, you should rely on inherent aspects of the design. That, for instance, you know the coefficients of the fuel, uh, the coefficients of the moderator. If not, you can uh, rely on systems. Uh, the activation of safety systems should be minimized because you don't want to go into accident conditions. If you have to go into accident conditions, there, is, there are requirements for automatization so that the operator doesn't need to be taking actions uh, from, from the beginning and is uh, overloaded by, by the situation, and, and so on. So maybe the final one is also that uh, the, the fundamental safety function there should be several means for uh, reaching or ensuring each of the fundamental safety functions, not just by, by one system. We come here into the application of the defense in depth. And we describe in the requirements the five levels that uh, probably has been explained already to you. And in some of the level, uh, we introduce the concept of uh, design extension conditions that I will come now to, to explain. But the design extension condition is something that we have introduced in the design. We have we are implementing some uh, provisions in the design to deal with situations that go beyond the design basis accident for preventing the Cormel or for mitigation of, of Cormels. So when we put there some more provisions in the design, there should be some independence. And here's where you have a requirement saying that uh, what you add should be independent from uh, the safety provisions for design basis accident to the extent possible. As I said, you cannot put, or you not practical to put two containments. But in that case, for instance, the, the containment should be designed for design basis access, so excuse me, for, for design extension conditions, for conditions involving uh, core damage. So interface with uh, uh, safety and security is important, but I'm not going to explain the same with the uh, proven engineering uh, practices that uh, we know. You have to be using applicable uh, codes and standards in the design. Um, Safety assessment uh, probably comes very often here in the discussion. It is important to conduct a comprehensive safety assessment, both from the deterministic point of view and also from the probabilistic point of view, to ensure that all relevant safety requirements are met uh, by the design of the plan, and not only at the beginning, but through all the stages of uh, plan, uh, plan life. Um, so these were these general requirements. Now I'm going to uh, explain also some requirements that are uh, this, uh, uh, were principal technical requirements. These are general for the plan design as well. And it go into some topics that uh, you have seen already the previous day. You have to define these uh, categories of uh, plan states. And these are um, group, you group them by, by frequency and any impact. Normally, of course, the, the more frequent is some condition, the small can be the consequences of these uh, conditions uh, happening. We use here the, the, the language of the IEA. We know in different countries, uh, sometimes they, they have also different categories. Um, here, we use this uh, two grouping of operational states and accident conditions. In operational states, we have normal operation. A normal operation needs to not be confused with the uh, operation modes of the plan. So when you are refueling or cold shutdown, hot shutdown, uh, etc. These are operation modes, but still, this is normal operation. Being, uh, being at, uh, in shutdown is not an abnormal operation. 
So then you have the anticipated operational occurrences, that this is something, conditions you expect to happen during the life of the plan. You design for them. And beyond that, we have the accident conditions. And there we have design basis accidents and design extension conditions. This has been explained to you, but so for each of the conditions, you assign some uh, acceptance criteria uh, regarding what can be the radiological consequences and can be also the, the, the impact on the, on the fuel. So when you are in an accident condition here in a DBA, uh, you don't have the same uh, requirements for uh, the impact on the, on, the, on the core than NAO. So here is it possible you, you have a large locker is you are required to maintain the, the cool, uh, geometry of the core and have the core uh, coolable and so on. So you can even tolerate uh, certain oxidation of the cladding and some failure of some fuel pins and so on. So there are some criteria, a certain criteria that, of course, here are not uh, are more restrictive and even more, of course, for for normal operations. So this. There is a categorization by, by frequency. This is less frequent. And then also associated, there is a acceptance criteria for a radiological consequence. I think also Marco provides some tables, some indicative values that were taken from the European utility requirements. Uh, this is important, uh, and I think it was explained about what is design basis, because sometimes people speak about the design basis of the plan, which is a bit uh, confusing, like an overarching uh, concept. In our understanding of the, the requirements, the design basis is for each SSC, for each component of the plan has its own design basis. So when you say, for instance, that uh, a large loca is, uh, is uh, part of the design basis or something like this, uh, what it really means is that the conditions generated by this large loca, the whole pressure on the containment, humidity, and so on, uh, whatever debris that go into the sump, etc., have been taken into account when you establish the design basis of some equipment that has to be working during large local or withstanding the large local and so on. So when you design, a, I don't know, uh, a pump for the emergency core cooling system has to take into account which conditions produces a large local, which conditions produces a, a steam generator to rupture and so on. So the design basis is for each SSC. We explain them later with a graph. I think you have seen as well what is the design basis and design limits. Now, the postulated uh, initiating events, we have been mentioning all the day. And it is important to mention that the design is to apply a systematic approach to uh, develop a comprehensive set of initiating events. So you have to make sure that this list of initiating event is, I would say, complete. I don't know if it's the adequate uh, word. So for that, there are several uh, processes. Of course, you don't start from scratch because nobody designs a nuclear power plant just for the first time. So we to take into account all the initiating events that have been considered up to date. And then, of course, you take into account a number of things that uh, the logic matrix of the instrumentation, and you do this FMEA and so on, try to see what happens after the plan, if this fails, if this fails, does it produce the initiating event? So you have to be identified, but this is a whole process, to identify uh, the initiating event and then ranking them by, by the consequences and ranking them also taking into account the likelihood, whether this is a, an AO, whether this is an accident, because this is necessary for the design. And in doing this process, an important thing to remark is that you also have to take into account, I mentioned in the morning, what are the initiating events that could take place also, not only because failures at the plant, but also because actions of the operator. You can, operators can also produce an initiating event. But possible failures arising from a internal and external hazard. This was the point in this, this, this morning. Because 
if an internal hazard or external hazard produces a PIE, an initiating event that for which you don't design, you, you have a, a, a problem. Then the ways to respond to initiating events, so preferably, as I mentioned before, in the first line, in inner implant characteristics, if not, take the benefit of passive features, if not, then the action of systems uh, in operation, then other systems, and finally, uh, the safety systems, and, and if this doesn't help, then you have to do uh, accident management, you have to use uh, operation uh, procedures. The internal and external hazard, I think this is something that uh, uh, we have covered this morning, but to come to the topic, you have to design for all forcible internal hazards and external hazards. And uh, so they should be carefully identified and the effects should be evaluated. And these internal hazards has to be taken into account for the layout of the plan is very important for determining the postulated initiating event and then for the design of the items important to safety because this equipment has to be either protected from the hazard or has to be designed in a manner that can withstand the, the effects of the, of the hazard. Um, now, I'm going just on the red part because this is what maybe is new and I want to also be important to highlight. We have introduced in the requirements, the new one that's going to be published soon, uh, some more restrictive or some more demanding conditions for margins. So uh, we say that uh, items important for, to safety should have adequate margins to withstand uh, hazards, both internal and external, taking into account the site evaluation, of course, this is for the external site evaluation, and to avoid cliff edge effects. So now, the agency language is always this adequate, sufficient, we never say 20% more, 30% more, or something like this. Only quantitative <laughs> values you will see in our requirements when you go to radiation protection uh, or something like this. But in the design, okay, you may say they play with the words, but this is what we can do, or we accept it. So the way we are emphasizing is that we don't want to see what happened in, uh, in Fukushima with the flooding or something like this. Well. We want to have more margins. That's a lesson learned. OK, you could say, in reality, in Fukushima, what happens is that the, mar the, 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 the input to the design was wrong. The design basis was wrong. These people didn't take into account the adequate level of tsunami, also not the, the, the earthquake. But the margins for the earthquake were sufficient to prevent important failures but there was no margin for the tsunami. So the tsunami was underestimated. As a result of their mistake, with the rest of the people now, we want to emphasize that we need to have margins. But for having margins, the first thing is to establish adequately the design basis. So we are requ requiring adequate margins against internal and external hazards. But that's not the end of the story. We also want that for items that are ultimately necessary to prevent large or early releases from the plant, the margins are even larger. That's what we are requesting now. Because the question is, what are those items that ultimately prevent their release of uh, radioactive materials from the plant? We will come into this point later. The point here is that we are requiring margins, and for some equipment, large margins. Engineering rules, of course, uh, items important to safety have to be uh, uh, designed according to uh, uh, national and international codes and standards with some engineering practice. Uh, the question sometimes is which codes we are going to be used for things like 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 that because sometimes we may not have a code or a standard for some uh, conditions. Okay. Uh, 
design basis accident, we know what is design basis accident. I will maybe not uh, uh, go into the very many uh, details, but uh, the design basis are there uh, for uh, establishing what is the what is the, the the boundary conditions that the plan has to withstand. The design basis accidents uh, or was what are the largest accidents that uh, we uh, take into account. And uh, design basis accidents are used to define the design basis of the safety system. For design basis accidents, we use safety systems. Uh, so, for design basis accidents, the plan should be controlled by the safety systems and should not necessitate offset intervention measures by design. Hmm? And there is also a, first, a last part is that the design of a safety system shall be done in a conservative manner. That uh, also makes a difference with the uh, design extension conditions that come here. So now this is this is new or relatively new in the in the design is new in the in our requirements. There has the concept of design extension condition has been introduced. And uh, this is something that it is there to enhance the capability of the plant to withstand uh, without unacceptable radiological consequences some accidents that are more severe than the design basis accidents or that uh, involve additional failures. And uh, these design extension conditions should be used to identify what are the additional accident scenarios to be addressed in the design and to plan practicable provisions for prevention of accidents, uh, such accidents, or the mitigation. So this we will explain later, carefully, uh, here to mention that for these design extension conditions, we don't apply the same design criteria as for the DBA. Uh, it is not required to fulfill the single failure criteria and uh, design extension conditions can be analyzed using the best estimate analysis. This is a relaxation for something you put in addition. Sometimes it's, uh, it's necessary and it is important. For instance, there is the best estimate analysis for, uh, for uh, civil accidents. I will explain why. Uh, but here, just think that if you will put design extension conditions, and you will design them with the same requirements, with the same manner as the design basis action, the system you put there, somebody could say, well, these are in fact then safety systems, and this is part of the DBA, and uh, it's possibly true. Uh, we have requirements for uh, safety classification. Uh, the safety classification is important. Uh, to attach the adequate, uh, uh, the adequate requirements to the different uh, equipment or structures in the design depending on the significance to safety. And it has an impact, of course, in the, in the economy of the plan because, I mean, the safety grade equipment is uh, more expensive uh, than uh, normal equipment. But the idea is to provide design requirements that are commensurate with the uh, significant to for safety of the of the equipment so we uh, classify them taking into account deterministic and probabilistic consideration and this also takes into account uh, how often the equipment uh, is called uh, upon to uh, is required uh, uh, to operate and uh, what is uh, what happens if the equipment uh, fails or not and, and so on so there are some uh, criteria for the safety classification. And at the IEA, we classify uh, the equipment in, in, in several categories. We have normal equipment. These are items not important to safety. And the rest is items important to safety. And within items important to safety, we have safety systems. That is very clear with the subdivision. I will not go into detail, protection, actuation, and so on. And then we have what we call safety-related items that are also are not safety systems, but are also important. So, for instance, the, the primary uh, circuit, uh, the cooling circuit, is not a safety system, or the reactor is not a safety system, but obviously 
it is not important to safety and as, as important as a safety system. But now the point is that we have introduced uh, the safety features for DEC that are not safety systems. And it's also a bit different from this one. So we have introduced this as a category. But the question is, what does it mean? Because now we have to define what are the codes and the design rules for tech. And they're not always clear. Um, there are several criteria, single failure criterion, common cause failures, and so on. You know them very well. I'm going to just talk about this common cause because it says that uh, the design of the equipment should take into account the potential for common causes. Yeah? Equipment important to safety. To determine how to apply some concepts again, common cause. And you have here diversity, redundancy, physical separation, and functional independence. Perceived reliability. So people often uh, relate common cause failure to, to diversity and say, if I want to avoid common cause failure, I need to provide diversity. That's not always true. You have to find out what is the reason for the common cause failure. Sometimes you have to apply physical separation. So because if you have a flooding here, it doesn't matter if this pump there is of this manufacturer and this one is of the other, or this is a steam dry, or this is a, everything is going to be flooded. So maybe the physical separation is what it comes. Also, even the redundancy, because not everything fails at the same time. But to give you an example, yesterday I came from Vienna in two aircraft, and uh, at both sides of the aircraft, the engines were the same. So I never flew in an aircraft who implement diversity. So I mean, have to be thinking what is what you need for reliability. So redundancy also helps, yeah? Because there is not, even if there is a common cause, sometimes not the common cause actuates at the same time in all the redundancy. Of course, there are some reasons that can affect both. And uh, we have also this in the next presentation, so a bit of an elaboration. So we have another, another general requirement that I will not explain. Uh, I'm just touching upon some of them. Qualification uh, is important. Uh, we mentioned this in the context of uh, internal hazards. That's why I bring it here. Because sometimes you can protect uh, an equipment from being exposed to, any, to, a, to a hazard. But sometimes it's sufficient or you can make it happen or work on the environment produced by the hazard. Of course, you cannot maybe not uh, expose to a hazard to a, a component to a fire. But because, well, even it can happen because I don't think nothing happens if you put a pipe uh, is exposed to, to, uh, to some fire or so on. But uh, so sometimes it's uh, not possible to survive in the conditions of the hazard. But sometimes it is, uh, it's possible with the adequate uh, um, qualification. And it's not only for hazard. It's also for accident conditions and so on. So the equipment in the containment has to be able to withstand the conditions created by local, by high radiation, and so on. So, so the equipment has to be designed for all the conditions in which it has to intervene. It will come later again. Um, this is another one that uh, we put and change and modify is about sharing systems and sharing safety equipment for them. I mean, it was a lot of debate about what does it mean sharing and all that thing. But one of the things that uh, can be also concluded or take into account from the accident in Fukushima is what happens when you have in a site several units and what happened with the uh, equipment there. So people say it's very good if we can share the equipment because if something fails, then I can use it in the other. But the question is what does it mean sharing? So the requirement is very clear. I don't know how people interpret them. But the question is here that we said that each unit at the plant where there are several units has to have its own safety systems 
and its own safety features for deck. So then, of course, you can provide in the design to enhance safety, can provide means to allow interconnections and so on. What it doesn't, what is not allow is that you say, I'm only going to have, I have, for instance, two units and only three diesel generators. And they say, okay, this is for one unit, this is for the other, and this is for both, or something like this. So reduce the number and, and, and so on. And the same with the SBO diesel. I'm going to have one SBO diesel for two units. At the end, it's an SBO diesel, the medicine diesel. No. The requirement is clear. You don't share. In a sense, you don't reduce the, you design the units as if they were be individual from this perspective. And then, if you want to enhance safety, you establish interconnections that allow you one unit to support the other, but not to economize and have less. Um, let me just. So this goes into now specific plan systems, and I'm skipping most of them because uh, there is no purpose you have been dealing with uh, different systems, I think, in the previous uh, lessons this week. I'm just making some emphasis in a, in, a, in a few things. And the one is here about reactor shutdown. For the reactor shutdown, you have to provide means to shut down the plant, the nuclear power plant, in any condition and maintain them in, the, in shutdown. Huh? in the most reactive conditions of the core. This is the only case here where the requirements in a clear manner and without distinction require two diverse and independent systems. Before, they tell you you have to be looking for common cores, you have to be seeing how, how to prevent common cores. The concept of redundancy, diversity, physical separation is implemented and so on. They were not instructing you do it like this. That's the only case in which the requirement say specifically the two means for shutdown have to be diverse. And then they say one of them should be capable of its own of maintaining the reactor subcriticality in the uh, any time. This is because, uh, as you probably know, the uh, in a PWR, shutting down the reactor with the control rods does not ensure you anti criticality in all the conditions. So if you cool down the reactor because of the coefficient of the moderator, you may be increasing the reactivity. So when you cool down, you go to shut down conditions, you have to be borating. But uh, the other system, the boration system, we took this diverse, I mean, one is the control rods, the other one is normally the introduction of some liquid poison. So the boration system, the emergency boration system, or the boration systems, this ensure under criticality in all conditions. Uh, mm, not I don't want to think I want to do something, anything from that. Okay, here, I'm putting that one here, skipping, because uh, after this lesson learned from Fukushima, uh, uh, before we just wanted to have uh, uh, a very high, uh, reliable um, systems to transfer the heat to the ultimate heat sink. By the way, for the agency, the ultimate heat sink is defined as the, a, a large body of uh, water or the atmosphere where the residual heat, or the heat from the core, is being transferred. Some people can sometimes consider the, 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 the essential service water, something like this is part of the thing. The thing is just the, 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 the ultimate part. So uh, now to achieve a high level of reliability in cooling the plant after Fukushima, we are asking for two things. So either to have an alternate ultimate heat sink, or if not, to have a, an alternative access or mean of transferring the heat to the ultimate heat sink. And this function also should be fulfilled for levels of natural hazards more severe than those considered for the design, taking into account 
the site hazard evaluation. In other words, this heat transfer chain to the ultimate heat sink needs larger margins than those that you will take from the input from the site to the design. Containment, um, I don't know if I want to go into that. What is the purpose of the containment, confinement, protection, of sun shield? Um, I'm going here because um, we have introduced now the capability to remove uh, heat uh, ensured by, should be ensured by systems with sufficient reliability and redundancy. And the design should also include features to enable the safe use of non-permanent equipment for restoring the capability to remove heat. The loss of containment of structural integrity shall be prevented in all plant states. So we need to preserve the integrity of the containment, always. And then we have introduced also now that the Fukushima, that there should be provisions to implement the use of uh, non-permanent equipment. And this I'm going to also to explain in my, in my last uh, presentation, because these non-permanent equipment are not part of the design. What is part of the design are the provisions for, for connection. Sorry? Yeah. Example. Yeah. It's very easy. So for instance, uh, you lose the, uh, the cooling of the core, uh, or the cooling of the containment, right? And then you have uh, some piping at the plant uh, that now this pump is des uh, properly designed in California. And there you come with your fire truck or something, you connect there, you have also operational provisions, but you have the adequate fittings and so on. And now you come and say, I connect here and I, I cool inside the containment. So this is what I mean by, by design provisions. But this is a, uh, uh, the, the connection is a, is a design provision. The, the, the track that comes, this is not part of the design. Yeah, it's possible. What do you mean in some conditions? Well, I mean, you have to put, I mean, uh, when you design these this connections, you have to put them in the correct place, yeah? Huh? And the same the, the, for power uh, supply and for electricity. So this is what, I mean, really is, is this for there, that uh, if you need it, you go and you connect. And it's not that, you know, oh, now uh, I have water, but I don't have a hose, and, and where do I put it? And do I connect to this pipe, and how do I do it? And I have to weld, I have to, and then which valve I need to operate, and maybe I cannot. So now it is considered in advance in the design where you will connect. Uh, in this case, it's for, for cooling, but if we come to power supply, we'll come the same. And still connecting uh, water cooling is easier. When you connect uh, power supply, it's more difficult because there are also um, uh, protections, electrical protections. So it's not that you just close the breaker and so on because, you know, the, the, the loads can be start protection stripping and uh, simply you can't, uh, you know. It is, uh, it is not that easy, even to synchronize uh, an, an SVO diesel to the, to the bar. And so it is, uh, you cannot uh, start the diesel and take all the loads of the bar, huh? because normally, for instance, the, the, the capacity of this diesel is not the, the same as the one of the Mercedes diesel. You have to make sure that you know there some loads are removed from the bus bar, then that there is not something like a load sequencer or something of protection that will trip down your... So it's more complicated. Now, the, the point is that it is required for the new plants that in spite of everything that you have in the design, you now have places for providing cooling and power supply. Power supply will come. And this is part of the design, the connection, but not what you will bring, because this is not part of the plan. You know? And also, we don't want to that the safety of the plan relies on this connection, eh? or, or, excuse me, on this portable equipment that for which there is not in requirements for quality, requirements for uh, reliability, and, 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 so, and so on. So you cannot compare uh, a diesel that you uh, bring in a truck 
with the diesel of a nuclear power plant that has a specific plant requirements. So at the moment, it's simply saying that we have included now the need for having connections to provide cooling of the container. Instrumentations, uh, I have something here because now the one thing is, of course, the, the digital instrumentation and uh, reliability and uh, independence of digital instrumentation. Uh, control systems should be uh, fully separated from, uh, from protection systems. Um, okay, now something, of course, about the control room comes to the same topic. Control room is one of the things that you have to make sure that it will be maintained operable, that it will maintain the habitability will be preserved. So for the control room, it is required that to withstand also hazards more severe than those taking into account for the, for the site hazard evaluation. There is a requirement for a supplementary control room, fully equipped or equipped as necessary. This is something to be used if you have to abandon the control room. For whatever reason, the control room availability is lost. The typical case is a fire in the control room. So people can simply not, uh, not stay there because they die or simply because uh, the, the, the equipment will fail. And you could not uh, operate from, from there. And there is now this emergency response center that we mentioned before, that there was in Fukushima. So now it's required that the, the, uh, uh, we have been changing the name, so I have to be very careful. But now it's called Emergency Response Facility. Before it was Technical Support Center. I think now it's called Emergency Response Facility. In other words, this is a, a place at the plant where you have uh, uh, information, all necessary information from the plan, but not only meaning papers, instructions, technical documents, and so on, but information on the plan operation. You have also information from the uh, plan parameters, not all of them, maybe, yeah? uh, for which the, the plan organization uh, can support uh, the operation of the, of the, control, uh, of the control room. Uh, the plan is not operated from there. Huh? You don't operate the plan from there. You can't. Huh? But you have the information to support the, the, the plant operation in case uh, of, uh, we will say, uh, it's for design extension conditions, basically. Should not be necessary for design basis action. Of course, you can use it, but should not be necessary. So this, uh, this is one of the facilities for which also we require larger margins, because if there is such an external hazard, you need to have it uh, available. This is also the place where in Fukushima, the people were then uh, taking shielding and taking actions at the plant. Uh, emergency power, uh, we have uh, introduced a number of changes, but uh, important, of course, you need to have emergency power for the case of uh, loss of say, power, that this is a safety system. But now uh, we have introduced the need for an alternative power supply. And this is for deck, basically. Huh? This is the, and this is there to both things, to uh, pre preserve uh, reactor cooling, and of course also the cooling of the spent fuel pool. And uh, if uh, this eventually fails and you uh, have a severe accident, also the, you should need uh, to have power supply to mitigate the, um, the consequence of a reactor core melt. And for, the, for this equipment necessary to mitigate civil accidents, we are requiring that this should be possible to be supplied by any of the available power sources at the plant. Yeah? Should be, of course, uh, supplied by the alternate uh, uh, power source, because you may go there because of an SVO, but sometimes uh, you go into a core accident uh, not because of an SVO. So uh, you want to have, in this case, the possibility of using any potential, any source available. There are other ones I don't want to describe, but I put this thing here just on the screen because we talk in the morning about the internal hazards. You will not find here something like a specific requirements for systems for flooding. We are finding things for uh, preventing the, 
open drops of equipment and so on. But fire protection is a specific system, a specific program, and the plan is important. It's reflected at the, at the requirements. And there are several others for each uh, type of plan, ventilation and everything, and instruments, but I don't think it's necessary to go one by one. I just wanted to give uh, an overview. I don't know how late I am with, uh, with the, with the uh, agenda. I, after you we maybe talk about the questions and so on, and I don't know if we have a break, then I'm going to have another presentation in which we discuss some more practical topics, because this is the requirements just as they are. But then in the other one, we may be talking about what is understood by one thing, but the other, and so on. In fact, one of the problems that we have now is that uh, we have introduced some of these topics in the requirement, and then we realize that there is not a common understanding on what they mean. You know, now we have difficulty to implement those concepts in the in the safety guide. Well, any questions now at this moment? And sorry for the boring presentation because you see, see that it is. <laughs> I see how your eyes were like this. So I try to improve for the next one. 